Hello, everybody. So I'm kind of violating one of my rough guidelines that I try to self-impose as to what topics I talk about on video. Um, and But that's because I've done a number of tweets in the past couple of days that a lot of people are really angry about, <laughs> you know, which I think is actually telling in its own right. Um, but I figure even though I haven't done a comprehensive piece on this yet in written form, I have enough of a coherent thought that it's worth expounding on somewhat extemporaneously here. And I will do a written version of it at some point. I don't know exactly when because I have a lot of other stuff to do. But the basic idea uh, is that, well, this is all generated initially when I did a thread on Saturday, early Sunday pointing out that Joe Biden launched his campaign in April with a video in which he made explicit reference to Charlottesville. He held up Charlottesville as one of the main reasons why he was running for the Democratic nomination because he wanted to put an end to all the divisiveness that Trump had wrought as best manifest by the Charlottesville incident in August of 2017 because Trump brings out all these most sinister elements of the populace and emboldens them and whatnot. And Joe Biden's the guy to cast aside that division and unite the country. And if you watch his subsequent speeches, this is the theme that he harps on frequently. And to some extent, it's got to be working because he's at the top of the polls nationally and in the primary, first primary states. Um, there was a poll, I don't know how reliable the firm is, but you know, 538 has a poll from South Carolina that came out today, which has him with something like, a, something like 40% in South Carolina and Bernie actually in single digits. I mean, that seems a little bit implausible to me. I don't know for sure if that's true. Uh, Obviously, we, it's impossible, but, but him having a very substantial lead is more than plausible. And this line that he's been putting out is effective because what have Democrats and the media, their media allies been saying for years now with respect to Trump? He's an existential menace. He's a fascist. He's a white nationalist. He is such a profound danger that he threatens the very fabric of the American Republic. I'm not exaggerating when I say that is what huge swaths of the elite media and mainstream Democrats have been saying over and over again for a long time. So it makes perfect sense if Democratic primary voters will say to themselves, okay, we accept all that as true about Trump. So therefore, our most rational course of action is to pick the guy who at least seems to be the most electable, quote-unquote, against Trump. Because our overwhelming and overriding priority at this time is to defeat Trump. So I actually think that their logic is sensible in that respect. I just don't agree with the formulation of the initial logic about Trump being this fascist. You know, you can say all kinds of things about Trump that are negative and accurate. I'll name a few here just to cover my bases, right? Authoritarian tendencies, of course. Impulsive. Has a government or is presiding over an executive branch that is constantly giving out incoherent policy messages. So one day you have John Bolton requesting a plan from the Pentagon to send 120,000 troops to, you know, to, to, the out, to the borders of Iran in preparation for a full-scale invasion. And then on the next day, you have Trump saying, I don't want war with Iran. I actually want to have talks with the leader of Iran without preconditions. Um, and on all other kinds of policy issues, something similar goes on with Trump. There was actually a really good piece in The Atlantic by Elena Plot last week where she reports on various directives and tweets that Trump has given over the course of his tenure. And you have to excuse the 
I don't know if you can hear the ambient noise outside my window, but like something's going on right now where they're like sirens blaring, whatever. Um, what's documented in that Atlantic piece is that Trump will often issue directives, usually through extemporaneous remarks or tweets, that the government, the, the executive branch officials who will be charged with implementing those directives simply ignore. Right? So... Although Trump has certain authoritarian tendencies on a personal level, he's not running the government in such a way as to really give any credence to the notion of him being an actually ideologically coherent authoritarian. Right? He just is he just is a sort of a pundit. He's the pundit in chief. He riffs. A lot of his rhetoric I do think is harmful. In that he's, he's constantly stoking this superficial culture war fury that really is divisive in a way that is not helpful at all and is actually damaging. Um, so all, the, all that can be said about Trump, but whether he is a fascist, I have simply never accepted. And I actually think it does harm to impart on the public that a fascist is running the government fascistically... Because that's going to have some detrimental psychological effects, obviously, if you genuinely believe that. And also, it skews your perception of how best to counteract Trump's genuinely damaging tendencies. So you're, you're, you're essentially fighting against a villain who doesn't exist in the way that it exists in your mind as a result of these blinkered, blinkered portrayals in the media and from the opposition party. But all that is to say, Biden is actually doing something strategically wise by focusing on Charlottesville because it creates this easy dichotomy for him where he's positioning himself against the Nazi enabling Trump and therefore he, Biden, is the most sensible choice to go against Trump and furthermore, any internecine disputes within the Democratic Party are not of any priority and, in fact, should be subordinated to the overwhelming need to depose Trump at all costs. So all that works to Biden's advantage. And what he's kind of doing is making use of a conservative lowercase c tendency that has been fostered in the electorate, in the Democratic electorate especially, because this frenzy and this all-consuming rage having to do with the threat of Nazis in the United States has encouraged that tendency, the lowercase c conservative tendency. Because, again, you have to put on a united front or a popular front, to use the old-time term, if... There are actual fascists running the American state. That's a, if that were true, that would be a situ situation so dangerous it would overshadow anything that you can almost conceive of politically. The only problem is it's not really true, or at least not true in the extremely hyperbolic sense that's often put forward in the media and by Democrats. But... Given how deeply entrenched that notion now is within the electorate, Biden benefits because he can say that we have to get past this division. Trump is an aberration. And we have to restore the pre-Trump status quo where Nazis weren't being enabled by the president. So that's actually a compelling argument if you're Biden on a strategic level. I'm not saying it's an normatively good for him to do. I'm saying in order to advance his own interests, that makes perfect sense strategy-wise. So in my thread, the initial thread on Saturday night, I said that left media is in part to blame by creating this frenzy because unbeknownst to them, apparently, they've done Biden a great service. And, you know, people you know, were just losing their minds over that. Which I don't mind, because it's true. I think a lot of the reason why people react to that these kinds of arguments, which I've made now and then, the reason why they react with such rage is because I, on some level they know it's true. And here's, here's what I, I, I always 
I, I, I also typically say leftists and liberals who constantly inflate the threat of Nazism in the United States are the mirror image of right wingers who during the Bush years and subsequently Trump even does this, you know, not as much as you'd expect, but obviously he does it frequently enough. These light right these left wingers who inflate the threat of Nazis are the mirror image of right wingers who inflate the threat of radical Islamic terrorism. Whenever I say this, people from both sides, and I'm not equating the both sides as morally equivalent, I'm simply observing that whenever I say this, both sides, you know, go wild with anger because they just can't accept that observation. Um, and one thing that I notice that left-wingers do is they'll say, like Jamel Bowie of the New York Times did this, one of my longtime antagonists, He'll say that, oh, you can't identify Charlottesville. How dare you identify Charlottesville as a relatively isolated and minor incident? I mean, one person was killed in Charlottesville. Is that bad? Of course. Was the ideology which gave rise to people gathering in Charlottesville in the first place noxious? Of course. But you have to put it in perspective. You have to have a sense of proportion. One person dying, while clearly regrettable, is not this all-consuming threat that it's made out to be. It's just not. It defies empiricism to suggest that. But what Jamel Bowie does is he says, in that isolated incident where you're, where you're downplaying, a per one person died. And, you know, I, I was really traumatized by that. That's just, you know, effectively what he said. And it's just like, you're a journalist or a columnist or whatever you are. You can't use your own personal trauma to dictate your analysis of political events. That's not how it should work. You should at least strive to attain some modicum of impartiality so that you can put aside your personal biases and strive to reflect events as they exist. Now, I'm not saying that, that means you, you conceal your political views. No, Bowie doesn't. I don't. I try to be as transparent as possible about that, but that doesn't mean that Concurrently, I can't attempt to at least be impartial in how I assess political events. That's why people get so angry that I talk about Biden as having some unique strengths in the Democratic primary race. I'm not supporting Biden by noting that he has those strengths. But you'll have them, people like Boo, invoke this language of like emotional trauma. And you know what? That's exactly what right-wingers and liberals and others did during the Bush years because they said that nobody could ever stop remembering 9-11 because if you ever forgot 9-11, well, you should go and talk to the relatives of the people who were killed. Or, you know, you're, you're, you're dishonoring the people who were injured in 9-11 if you don't keep it at the forefront of your minds and allow 9-11 to dictate U.S. policy. Well, guess what allowing 9-11 to dictate U.S. policy ultimately did? We got the Patriot Act. We got the war in Afghanistan, which is still going on today, uh, you know, 18 years later. We got the Iraq War. We got all kinds of similarities encroachments. We got just a general corroding of civil discourse. So if you were skeptical of the magnitude of the threat posed by radical Islamic terror. You were somehow apologizing for violent jihadism, which is absurd. I'm not in favor of violent jihadism. I oppose it. I oppose religious extremism of all kinds. Kinds. I'm not a religionist. But that doesn't mean that I'm not able to put into perspective the threat posed in the United States by radical Islamists, which is small. Now, if you're going to talk about Syria, the different story. There are system systemic structural reasons why people in Syria have very good reason to fear Islamic terrorism. You know, ISIS commanded a large uh, you know, uh, amount of physical territory in Syria 
for a long time and subjugated women, killed you know apostates, all the kinds of brutal stuff that they did. So yeah, obviously if you're in Syria, you fear rightly violent jihadism or violent radical Islamism. That's just not the case in the U.S. Do we every now and then have some you know lone actor commit an act of violence? In the name of you know, their warped version of, uh, of, rat, of Islam or because they're pledging fealty to ISIS? Yeah, we have that. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not a monumental threat. The, the, the most deadly mass shooting at the time was the Orlando Pulse shooting in June of 2016. 49 dead. 50 including the shooter. Was that a horrible event? Of course. It was traumatizing for the people involved, traumatizing for LGBT people because he uh, attacked a gay club, even though it doesn't seem as though he was motivated by anti-gay animus. He actually was motivated by disdain for U.S. foreign policy. If you actually look at what he said on his 911 call, um... Uh, but either way, whatever his motivation, this idea that it was right to extrapolate that event into some belief that there is this all-consuming menace posed by radical Islamists in the U.S. is just foolish. It's empirically unsound. But that's what left-wingers and liberals do with regard to the supposed threat of Nazi terrorism. Again, do occasional instances of, quote, Nazi terrorism occur? Yeah, every now and then. Is it bad when it happens? Of course. Should the assailants be held responsible? Yes. But that doesn't mean we should allow a, our national political narrative to be dominated by this relatively minor threat. It's the same logic across the board. Whether it's Nazis or radical Islamists, I'm not in favor of inflating, inflating the threat of terrorism because you know why? Bad policy always flows from that. With regard to right-wing terrorism, and you know, I guess you, uh, one, one thing that people were you know, criticizing me for is that I use the word Nazi rather than just right-wing terrorism overall. Well, I mean, I don't think it makes sense to conflate all right-wing terrorism with Nazism, even though Nazi is the term that liberals and leftists frequently use to describe all left-wing terror, all right-wing terrorism. You know, there's been right-wing terrorism in the United States for hundreds of years. Often, it's isolated and sporadic and carried out by lone wolf types acting alone or with, you know, a small group. Sometimes, it's systemic, and I put that in a different category. So, like the KKK, you know, doing organized lynchings with the backing of local law enforcement. Um... Uh, I, I, I don't see that as sporadic violence. That was something that was structural, right? So I don't think it was threat inflation in the 1920s to warn about the KKK systematically oppressing minorities. So that's a separate issue. I'm talking about when one guy or like one guy and two of his buddies carries out some crazy lone wolf attack. That's sporadic violence because it's not connected to a larger political organization. It doesn't have the backing of the state. I mean, the KKK had the backing of the state. If Because a lot of, you know, law enforcement and sheriffs were members. So that's an entirely separate issue. But in terms of just random acts of right-wing violence, that goes back hundreds of years. I mean, and in terms of, like, Nazi threats... That's not a new thing. A guy who is actual, an actual Nazi in 2009 attacked, a, you know, shot and killed a security guard at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember 2009, but I do. And Trump wasn't in power at that point, right? So that's an indication that this is just a constant. It's something that is inevitable. And left-wing violence is inevitable too. I'm not equating the two morally. I'm just observing that these things happen and they will always happen. 
Remember, a guy, James Hodgkinson, in June of 2017, opened fire on a congressional baseball outing by, Congress, by, by, Repu- by congressional Republicans. Now, this guy was a Bernie supporter. He had some, you know, cr- he made some crazy posts about Russia. I'm not blaming Bernie, of course, for that. But could you imagine if a Nazi opened fire on a gathering of Democrats? I mean, <laughs> there would be an utter meltdown and everybody would be blamed who had even the remotest association with that event. And I'm not for making these specious causal connections between random acts of sporadic violence and political figures, people you don't like. It's so easy and it's always so logically flimsy. I think people ought to just accept that random acts of violence are an inevitability in in American life. Can you take practical steps to counteract them at times? I guess, sure. But you're never going to stop them completely. Now, one interesting fact that I think people would be shocked to hear, because you wouldn't hear it if you just follow most progressive media, is that in 2017, the same year as Charlottesville, the same year when there was a the moral panic around... Nazism reached its peak. Do you know how many people were killed in the United States by Islamic terrorists versus white supremacist, white supremacist terrorists? There were more people killed by Islamic terror than white supremacist terror in 2017, in that very year, which saw this insane escalation in in rhetoric around the purported threat of Nazis. And all that derives from one truck attack that some guy did in Manhattan, um, you know, who, who, who pledged allegiance to, you know, radical Islam. That guy killed eight people in Manhattan. And if you tally up all the people killed from white supremacist terror that same year, how many total? Four. So I'm not saying that means that we should be, you know, that we should be super fearful of Islamic terrorism either. Both threats are minuscule. Eight people? Four people? I mean, I know that there is a specific meaning around terror in particular, but I thought that we all recognized during the Bush years how emotionally manipulative these constant invocations of terrorism is and how it makes people illogical. And encourage them, encourages them to support counterproductive me, uh, policy measures. What happened to that? But still, I mean, I think it is ironic that if you look at that one year, more people were killed by radical Islamists. Did you know that? Would you, if you were following just popular media discussion, do you think you would know that? And when that truck attack in Manhattan occurred at the time, I said, just as I say when there's a you know a random right wing terror event, okay, people, relax. Let's not overreact to this. Let's not make this the defining feature of our political discussion because of the deleterious effects that that inevitably has. That's my approach across the board. And you know, but but you know, threat inflation is just a constant in U.S. political life. People who would want to advance a particular political agenda will take these sporadic acts of violence and formulate it into this grand narrative that is self-serving and bolsters their sense of moral superiority. And yeah, it's not a high bar to clear to be morally superior to like genuine white supremacists. So it's just like you're not making a great point there. Um, anyway, I mean, this, this issue, it it really is amazing to me how angry it makes both people on the left and right when I make that observation, because they're, you know, the right, the right wingers will scream, 
Radical Islam is a much bigger threat than you're admitting. I mean, this is so horrible. Sharia law is going to, you know, um, going to be instituted in, in like Nebraska next week. It's just like so stupid. That's what I was mostly fighting against in the late, you know, early to late Obama years. That ridiculous right wing alarmism. But now there's a version of left wing alarmism with regard to, to Nazis. And I, I find it foolish. But I think people freak out so melodramatically because on some level they know what I'm saying is true. I mean, some are so blinkered that they have no, they, they have no recognition that it could be at all true. Uh, but I think others, if you actually you know, press them and, and force them to think a little bit rationally, they could understand that it's got to be true to some extent. Um, yeah, so you know, that's about it for now. <laughs> Uh, and I will talk to you all later.